forgot to mention this morning, new calendars are here and back on the table, so uh, help yourself to uh, what you need and take a couple extra to hand out. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 4, we, in this section, verses 7 on, down through about verse 16, we'll be dealing with gift given to the body of Christ. In verse 7, we read, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. It's obvious in verse 7, According to the measure of the gift of Christ, that he's not just he's not talking about the gift of salvation per se, mm -hmm. but he's talking about something extra, which is given to his body, the body of Christ, which is his church. Yes. In verse 8, which is the verse that we're ready for today. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. God has given grace the gift of Christ according to the measure of Christ to all the Ephesian saints whereby they are enabled now your mind's got to go back to verses preceding and what talking about and what we're building up to, whereby we're enabled to contribute to the unity and edification of the church, of the body of Christ. Each one, each member, in the body of Christ has been given the gift whereby they are able to unify and to ed edify the body of Christ. What to, does that say to those who are not doing so? It's just a thought-provoking statement in, in these verses. What's that say to those who are not doing so? They're not exercising the gift that they've been given to unity and some gift to edify, to build up. What I've been given differs from what you've been given. But as we all have Christ, that ought to promote unity. And then according to the measure of the gift that Christ gives to each one of us, whatever that gift is, 
is to be used to edify the body. And look in verse 8. Wherefore, what does wherefore mean? What means wherefore? But what does it mean? <laughs> it means on account of. On account of what has been said before and on account of what he's about to say. It all points us back to, to Christ, the gift, the, the grace which God gave and the gift given to his church according to the measure of the gift of Christ. <laughs> And that states that Christ determines that. Yes. Now verse 8 goes into the victor, to, to the reason why that Christ gives a gift to his body. I think you're going to see that he's the victor. Before he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Well, who ascends up on high? <coughs> the victor does. He he ascends up on high upon the mountain. And he takes his, his rest. He takes his ease. He's, he's taken the spoils of victory with him. And he's given gifts unto men. He's given of those spoils unto men. Jesus Christ is our victor. He ascended up on high and he led captivity captive. The words he saith. Well, what do you think of when you see that? If you were reading that in your devotions, would you take time to find out where it was that he said this? <coughs> he saith when he ascended on high. He saith, well, well, the fact that it's been said before. Do you take the time to find out where it was said before? We should. <laughs> because this is a, a verse quote almost identical. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms in chapter 68. <coughs> And I want verse 18, but I want to read a couple verses before that. Why, uh, verse 16, why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the hill which God desireth to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Where's your mind going to? The psalmist here is, is talking about 
about something that was common to the Israelite who dwelt in the holy place. God did. The Lord did. Verse 18. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. That is, that is literally talking there. He, he took gifts for men. He, he, is, he has received them as, as virtue of the victor. And, and the spoils of war were his to be had. Yea, for the rebellious also that the Lord God might dwell among them. What is the psalmist talking about here? Well, this is a, a psalm is prophetic, as you're going to see, is prophetic concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's relating an experience that he experienced. Come with me to the book of 2 Samuel. Book of 2 Samuel in chapter 6. And look with me at verse two, 1. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark. Mm -hmm. We got the picture? Mm -hmm. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. This ark of the Lord was known as the Lord was dwelleth between the cherubims. Because you had you had the Ark of Covenant, and what was on the Ark of Covenant of the Covenant? The mercy seat, and with two cherubs, one on either end, overlooking the mercy seat, and that was where God dwelt with the children of Israel. That's where God communed with Moses and spoke to them from the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle has been pretty much laid to rest except some of the instruments that were in it. But they kept the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because that was where God was. Now, Verse 3 is a sad verse. And what is related after that, down through uh, maybe verse 10. But verse 3 said, And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. Well, that's, a, that's good. Ain't I, I mean, David's all excited. He's the victor. He, he, he's, he's, he's gotten the victory. And he's going he's gonna to take the ark and he's going to take it up the mount, to Mount Zion. 
to the city of David. The only thing is, something's wrong. What's wrong? Did you, do you know your Bible? Do you know the instructions that were there? Well, they, they went on, and, 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 and things got a little teetering in that, on that card as they were going, and, and, and Uzzah put forth his hand to, to study it, and God struck him dead. Amen. Oh, David, he's kind of beside himself, and mourning, groaning, and <coughs> complaining why God strike him dead, and and all this, I mean, I'm trying to get the get it up to <laughs> send God up the mountain. He wanted to be put on a cart. It was to be born on the shoulders of the priest, the Levites. Amen. And they went to touch it. <laughs> David came to this realization. Hold your finger there and, and turn back to the book of Numbers. Book of Numbers in chapter 7. Verse 9, but unto the sons of Kohath he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary, which of the tabernacle, belonging unto them, was that they should bear upon their shoulders. When on the sanctuary is grown, but the ark of the covenant is still there. It was to be born upon their shoulders. I said that David came to uh, realization of this, and, and when he saw that, that uh, uh, what was it, Obed-Edom's house was blessed because uh, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was in Obed-Edom's house for, for three months, and, and the Lord greatly blessed him because of the, the Ark of the Covenant, then David was ready to go get the Ark again. Turn with me to, uh, keeping your finger there in 2 Samuel, but turn, turn with me to uh, 1 Chronicles. You see, you got to know your Bible, or you, or you got to do some research in your Bible and, and find these things. But in, in uh, chapter 15, in, look at verse 6. No, that's not the verse I want. Well, what verse do I want? Well, for, come, come up a few verses. In verse 1, And David made uh, him houses in the city of David, and prepared a place for the ark of God, and pitched for it a tent. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. I wanted to show you that, that David had, had come to that realization. Now he's, he's going to get the ark and he's going to get it uh, proper as he ought to get it. In verse 12, and it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and all that pertaineth unto him, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up Zion, up Mount Zion, the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. 
See, the city of da David was, was actually, uh, uh, when David conquered, uh, was a, a, a stronghold at the top of Mount Zion. And David conquered and became the city of David. And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fastings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with sound of the trumpets. Now look at verse 1 of chapter 7. And it came to pass when the king, David, sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. You see, what's that a sign of? That's a sign of a victor. A victor who has ascended up on high, the top of Mount Zion. And he dwelt in his house. The Lord had given him rest from all his enemies. He had conquered them. Amen. He'd been victorious in battle. And he gave spoils. <laughs> The spoils of victory he gave run to his men and unto all that were there. So, when he ascended, <laughs> the psalmist had reference to God. God represented by the Ark of the Covenant. It was his dwelling place, right? The mercy seat between the cherubims was sat upon the Ark of the Covenant. It had just been brought up to the city of David. That's what the psalmist was writing about there. He recognized in Psalms chapter 68, and the writing thereof, that it was the Lord who was the victor. It was the Lord who gave him the victory. The Lord has his 20,000 chariots, hey, and thousands of angels. <laughs> you see, he recognized the Lord. Amen. Was the victor. This is prophetic. These two passages, Psalm 68, and if you want, David, victory, being the victor, and ascending on high with the Ark of the Covenant, leading captivity captive and giving gifts unto men. And so Paul quotes it here to the Ephesians, which also gives us the understanding that it is a prophetic passage of Scripture, portraying whom? The grace that God gave and Jesus Christ is given by measure as it pleases him. As pleasing to him. This phrase also in our text, verse 8, tells us the time frame in which he led captivity captive. What is the time frame? Well, it can, it can be none other than when he died on the cross, was placed in the grave, but then arose victorious. 
He rose as a victor. And as the victor, leading captivity captive, he rose. Satan, sin, all his forces have been held captive. Turned captive to Christ. That tells us something else, doesn't it? Well, God knew what he was talking about when he told Adam and Eve. When he told the serpent that the serpent's seed was going to bruise the heel of Christ. And thus he did when he died and was placed in the grave. But it was just a bruised heel. It wasn't, wasn't death. And Christ delivered a death blow. Genesis 3.15 tells us about that. You see. So, he led captivity captive. Turn with me to the book of Colossians. In chapter 2. In verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He's talking about Jesus Christ in this passage of Scripture. starts out, For I would that ye knew the great conflict I have, that, they, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and under all riches of full assurance of understanding and acknowledging of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom, in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and goes on and just keeps talking about Christ and the things in Christ. And him blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against them. Verse 15 has him the victor, has him spoiling those principalities and powers, making a show of them openly. Oh, yes, so 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the proof of his resurrection. You see, that's part of the gospel. Paul's reminding the Corinthians of the gospel which he delivered unto them, how that Christ died, was buried, and rose again according to the scriptures, and was seen of Cephas and the twelve, and five hundred, and he even goes on to say, and as of me as one born out of due time. Proof and evidence, a show openly of his victor, of his leading captivity captive. Now, what did he capture? Well, we've already referenced a couple of them. Sin. Sin. Did he not? Was he not the victorious over sin? Yes. Turn with me to the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 8. Verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. <coughs> and did you notice later on that that brother stopped there yesterday? When he quoted that verse? I don't that one. Well, you can't stop there. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk 
after the spirit, not after the flesh. That's important. See, there are many say, say they're, they're in Christ Jesus, but their works deny them. You see, well, that's not the verse we want anyhow. Verse 2, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, yea, there's a greater, there's a victor. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. He defeated sin and condemned it. In where did he do that at? In the flesh. Something you and I are unable to do. But he did it. <laughs> he did it. Through with Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. In chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Talking about when he came and was made flesh. Before that, he knew no sin. But he was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He knew no sin. He did no sin. He was incapable of sin. Amen. You say, well, I've never heard that before. We well, haven't been listening to me preach then. Amen. Why was he incapable of sin? He's God. He's God. It didn't matter he was walking in flesh and blood. He was still God. And as God, He's holy and just and perfect. He could not sin. It's against His nature. Amen. Contrary to who He is. You see. Now, look with me at the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. In verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are Here's the victory. Amen. Yet without sin. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? There's not, not ever been another flesh and blood walked upon the earth without sin. One only. He was victorious over it. So he led sin captive. <laughs> is that is that special to you? Well, better be. Your salvation rests on it. Not only that, the completion of your salvation rests on it. What is the blessed hope? The glorious appearing and return of the Lord Jesus Christ is the blessed hope. And, and what does that mean? The glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm going to look him in the face. I'm going to see him face to face. 
without sin. Uncle B, just as he, without sin. Listen, that, that's precious. That ought to put a smile on everyone who say, born again, it's face. That he's the victor over sin. He led it captive. One day it's going to have no power over us. It has, it, it doesn't, according to Romans chapter 6, it doesn't have power over us now. You say, why well, doesn't it have power over us now? I, I said, no, uh -huh. that's your own doings. You have the Spirit of God. If you're his, you have the Spirit of God. And that's what Romans 8 is written about, too. Goes on to tell about. Sin doesn't have the dominion over us any longer. It's only when we yield to it, you see. And we yield because we haven't trusted in Him to deliver us from. Well, I'll move on. Satan. Satan's captive. We already referenced, referenced that. We talked about Genesis 3.15 and the fact that Satan's been delivered to death. But why, why? If Satan's been delivered to death, well, why, why is he so, so prevalent today? Well, he's in captive. His, uh, his days are numbered. And he knows it. Because he failed at Calvary. He failed at the tomb. Yes. He failed to keep him in the grave. And so his days are numbered. Hebrews chapter 2. And verse 13 says, in Hebrews 2 and verse 13, and again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. He had to go through the death in order to destroy Satan who has the power of death. Sin. Curse. For the wages of sin is death. Product of Satan. Second Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter two. Verse twenty four. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. He's talking about those that oppose the truth. They oppose the truth of the gospel. The truth of Jesus Christ. If God peradventure will give them repentance. <laughs> you see, the, the, the servant of God must continue on being faithful to proclaim the gospel, yea, even when they oppose the truth, when they oppose it. They don't want to hear it. We don't know what the will of God is. We know the will of God for us is to preach the gospel. Just continue to be faithful to preach it. Yeah, even to those that you have resisted it before, have opposed it before, 
God gives you an opportunity, preach to him again. That's what he's telling Tim <laughs> Timothy here. Peradventure will give them repentance. Maybe God will in time give them repentance. That's why we don't get tired of, of, of ministering to and praying for someone for 25, 30 years. As long as they are drawing breath, maybe God put a venture. We'll grant to them repentance. To the acknowledging of the truth. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, out of captivity of the devil. By, by God, peradventure, giving them repentance of, and, and the truth, <laughs> they are delivered from the captive of Satan and are taken captive by him at his will. <laughs> you see? Work gladly. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ. With gladness, freedom, liberty. Not to do what I want to do, but to serve Him. We couldn't do that before. Those that oppose the truth, they couldn't do that before. But if God gives them repentance, and the truth. Now they can. Now they can serve him. You see. First John chapter five. In comparison, we look at these at two verses here, verses four and five of chapter five. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. What is an overcomer? Well, he's a victor. Did you know we have the victory? Because Christ had the victory? Yes. Christ got the victory. And so we're victors. Amen. You see. And we share in the Spoils of victory. Gifts given <laughs> unto men. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Believeth. That doesn't mean that one day, 20 years ago, you believed in, but now today, uh, I, I, I really don't. No. <laughs> if you really believe then, you believed every day since then, and you believe until he comes or until this body's laid in the grave. Amen. You see. And it says, those who believe, those who have faith, are the victors. Yes. Yeah. Why? Because he was the victor. He's the victor. And our faith is in him. Well, we've got the victory over the world. You know, I maybe got ahead of it. Head of the game with reading John, First John five and verse four. Who is he that overcometh the world? Even our faith that we overcome in the world. We, he, he, the world. He led the world captive. Turn, turn with me, John, John chapter sixteen. This is some of the spoils of victory. Think about that. He led captivity, captivity. This is some of the spoils of victory. Because they're captive to him. They don't have power over us. Verse 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me 
ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good courage. I've overcome the world. And because he's overcome the world, we, we shall too. We shall too. You say, well, why, why can't I have it today? <laughs> well, it's not his time for you to yet. But we shall too. Death. Well, <laughs> yeah, he led de death captive. Death for you and I had no power any longer. We're not going to be separated from God for eternity. Amen. We're going to dwell eternity with Him. Amen. Turn with me to, to Romans chapter 6. Yeah. Romans chapter 6. In verse 9. Yeah. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead yeah. dies no more. <laughs> Death hath no more dominion over him. We're in Christ Jesus. He's in us. Because he, he died. He, he's not going to die again. He, he rose. Victorious. Because he rose. We're going to arise. <laughs> We're going to send up. Well, we the victors. Yeah. Over the grave. <laughs> Over the grave. Matthew chapter 28, verse 6. Remember? Mary and those other couple women they came to the grave. They were looking for Jesus and they said, He's not here. For He's arisen. <laughs> grave, grave had no power over Him. They keep Him. He had power over the grave. You see? 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 54 through 56. Well, let's read that. that uh, those, are, those are some more blessed verses to, to read. 1 Corinthians 15. <coughs> 54. So when this corruptible, uh, this flesh and blood, shall so put on incorruption <laughs> at the body like his, Shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. <laughs> What's mortal? Subject to die. What's immortality? Not subject to die. <laughs> <clears throat> then shall be brought to pass the same. That is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, and Jesus defeated it, brought him into captivity. <laughs> Praise God. Well, even our spiritual enemies... said, Satan has no power over you and his angels, his demons have no power over you. 1 John chapter 4 verse 1 Beloved, believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets are going out into the world Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. 
Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. <coughs> confesseth and confesseth. They go to their grave confessing. Confessing their sins and believing that Jesus Christ gives them the victory. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Boy, if it was 2,000 years ago, how much more is it today? Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We can overcome those spirits. We can overcome Satan. We can overcome his demons. We can overcome those false prophets, those false teachers out there who deny God. They deny God by confessing not that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and is the Son of God. We've given the victory. Satan, a child of God cannot be demon-possessed. First place, Satan's demons wouldn't want to dwell with the Spirit of God. <laughs> but the Spirit of God is greater than Satan, so they can't possess us. Amen. If you were demon possessed at the time of salvation, them demons went fleeing. God cast them out. Amen. We see example after example of that in scriptures. The Lord Jesus Christ casting them demons out. And then they're sitting there and clothed and in their right mind. Amen. <laughs> confessing the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can be influenced and they can influence you to do evil, to do wrong, to sin. And we experience that. But greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. We don't have to submit. We don't have to give in to those temptations that come our way. So then why do we? Well, just in closing, on this thought, Romans chapter 8 and verse 37, and we'll be done. Romans 8 and verse 37, I promise we'll be done. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. Now, you ready to go out and live for Christ? You ready to, to promote unity in his body and edify the body of Christ? All right.